I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and as always, I'm thrilled you're here. Uh, we've got such a great episode today. You know, we're always talking to different people in the children's universe world, and this is going to be a lot of fun. We have Eric Herman on this week. Eric is, is psychedelic rock for kids. He was in an alt band. He came in and did all of this, changed kind of what he's doing. He's got a new album out. And uh, as he says, he makes cool music videos for kids. Eric, how are you? Hi, Carrie. I'm wonderful. Thank you for, for talking with me. I really appreciate it. You know, it's fascinating what you've done. And I really want to talk about, because you were doing something totally different, uh, different music, and then got into the kids entertainment world, which I found happens a lot. Like I was a, a musician in college and was never looking for kids entertainment. And I I stumbled into it and then I just fell in love with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I've found it similarly too with uh, friends and associates who do what I do. Uh, they were doing something completely different and, and for a variety of reasons, circumstances pushed them in, a, in this direction. And uh, for me, I was playing, I was living in Buffalo, New York my whole life and playing in a bunch of different bands, um, rock bands, progressive jam bands, uh, a lot of alternative kind of things. And uh, I was doing theater, live theater. I, I wrote a musical that was staged in Buffalo. And uh, so there was all these different things. And then um, at one point in about, uh, over the course of a few months, a few different people unrelated to each other suggested to me oh you know you should do something for kids or music for kids or something along those lines for example one of them was my my brother-in-law at the time uh, is a gym teacher at an elementary school and he said you know some guy came in and did an assembly with music and I think you could do that and at the time uh, each, individually those things I was like oh I don't know you know I, I love kids I love music but I, I didn't see myself wanting to do that certainly not for 18 years now <laughs> <laughs> but then I think it was the combination of all of them together and my wife uh, Roseanne was um, uh, also she had uh, had a, a partial degree in, in early childhood development she would she was interested in the idea of working for kids but she also didn't push me in any direction uh, whatever I wanted to do with music she was okay to, to help with but when that confluence of, of uh, encouragement sort of came together, she was all for it. And I eventually kind of came around uh, to, to say, oh, you know, this could be really fun. I, I think I had this uh, misperception of, of what children's music was uh, that, uh, you know, I meant for, you know, very small kids, two-year-olds or, you know, um, and, and I, I wanted. You know, that's, I want to jump in on that because I think that's interesting. Sure. Because I think that's what it it, it was, right? Well, Bernie's Bernie songs were really just for the kids, just for that audience. Yeah, and he's that's great it. for and that. that. And that's not exactly what you're you're doing. Your your music can definitely um, adults can enjoy it, even though a lot of the lyrics and things were for kids and lessons for kids. It's 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 definitely got a more adult sound, I think is the way I put well, it. Well, when we started to do it, actually, you know, create music for kids, the first thing I did was I went to a bunch of different libraries in Buffalo and I took out all these CDs because I really didn't know. I mean, I grew up listening to Schoolhouse Rock and I loved that, right. Sesame Street. But as far as like having an album or a CD of music, like I just, for whatever reason, I had this you know, uh, blind spot to what that could be. And I remember I took out all these CDs and I, oh my gosh, I just loved so much of it. And I realized you can do all kinds of different things, comedy, 
uh, characters, uh, voices, uh, rock music, folk music, reggae, blues, it kind of didn't matter the kind of music you did as long as the focus or the lyrics had some attention or um, intention for children of some age. The other thing too is when when we started doing it, we kind of wanted to focus towards an older range of kids, maybe six to eight or something, because we realized that if you write something for really young kids, older kids, nah, they're not going to, but if you do it the opposite way, older kids like it. And then younger kids might still kind of like, well, I want to figure out what that means. Like, or they, they get it on one level and then maybe later or their parents explain what this means or this word or this joke. Now they can also appreciate it. I feel like it, it works a little more broadly. Yeah. And it's interesting because I agree. I never really thought of it that way, but, but I absolutely see that because the kids that were watching Barney, you know, when it got older, it, it wasn't cool. <laughs> that, that, those, oh those, yeah. Those and it's, songs. you know, so I know what you're saying, but he, and then the other, the other approach, and I'm not saying that my way is the, the right way. It was right for right. me or is what I want to do, but right. is to, to super target, you know, and, and, and Barney is, excellent for that really young age right you, really, you know so and then but yeah not so much for you know five six years you know then right. you're you're probably done with barney but <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're a 10 year old you're making fun of barney you know right. it's, it, it hits different stages but <laughs> so, so you just so you kind of started that process out um and where did it go from there did it start into an album? Were you doing live performances? How did well, it start? Yeah, and, and and it really started with one song, um, which um, is still my biggest song. So it's all been downhill since then, <laughs> called The Elephant Song. Which I was, um, was going to get to. I didn't realize that was your first song. Yeah, yeah. It was literally the first song that I... And that one wasn't even supposed to be a kid song. Uh, the story is kind of funny my wife and I were watching uh, a PBS documentary, I think it was about elephants. And uh, it was uh, two elephants that grew up together when they were young, but then one of them was sent to a zoo and one of them was sent to a circus, something like that, where they were separated for 30 years, I want to say. It was a long, very, very long time. And then uh, they were brought back together. You know, they had footage of them young and then oh they made some arrangements to bring them back together and they knew each other and they hugged each other and it was this oh my gosh this this heartwarming feeling that you got to realize that they they still had that connection and kind of kind of the sadness of being separated the way they were you know uh and i remember feeling like oh i gotta write this song this meaningful song and it was it wasn't going to be about elephants per se but but it would have that sort of um, underpinning to it. Um, and I, I wrote all the music in, you know, an hour or so. And then, you know, I thought, oh, that's really nice. Uh, it, it, and I intended it to be this deep, meaningful, philosophical song with deep resonance. And, <laughs> and I could never get past the first couple lines of words that I had. I think it was long, long time, missed you so much. I finally got these chains off of me. All this time, waiting for your touch. Something, something, I can't remember anymore what it was, but, and that's all I had. And I couldn't get any farther. Like, what is, what, where's it gonna go? What's it gonna mean? It got to the point that Roseanne started making fun of me when she'd hear me working on the song because she knew it was that elephant thing. And, right. and I was just trying to get and I couldn't get anywhere. And one day she walks by and she's joking, jokingly says, elephants, I like elephants. It was one of these just weird things that like well, just came out of her head and she just started singing that make, making fun of me trying to write that elephant song. And I think at the time I was like, oh, come on, go away. I'm working. <laughs> you know? And and it was, I think the next day 
I'm driving in my car and I start singing that line when I'm here because I had the music recorded and I'm trying to come up with words. It's kind of how I work, you know, we're, um, mumbling things, trying to lock in some kind of vocal melody or lyrics. And I start singing elephants. I like elephants. And again, here comes another point of strange uh, creative magic. I went, got to the next line and I said, I, I, I'm trying to find the, the key here. I like how they swing through trees. And at first I'm like, what? That's right. Oh, huh? That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, and I, but then I, oh, ooh, light bulb, because we had been talking in the previous weeks about maybe doing something in the kids' music genre. And suddenly, like the, as much as I tried to push it away initially, what? This is ridiculous. Forget. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this could actually be a thing, where you know you just get it wrong each time and it moves on to the next animal monkeys i like monkeys i like how they swim in the ocean i like and so we i went home that day after work and i told this idea to roseanne and we in probably five minutes we did the rest of the word rest of the lines you know it was a very simple thing just get it wrong each time, you know, and then move on to a different animal. And it circles back to the elephant at the end. And then I remember thinking, are kids going to think this is fun or are they going to think I'm just an idiot? <laughs> Turns out it was both. It was both things. We went to, to get back to your, your other thing, how it started. Right. Uh, when I, I had that song, and I had learned some of the other songs from those CDs I took out from the library of a variety of different people, uh, you know, and songs that I liked. And uh, I said, well, we got to do a show at some point. And one of the coffee shops that I played at in Buffalo uh, frequently doing, you know, grown up music and original songs and I don't know, Beatles or, you know, whatever it was, Bob Dylan. Uh, they said, yeah, come in on a Saturday afternoon and do a little thing for kids. And, and we had a, maybe 10 people show up and, you know, a handful of kids and it was fine, but that one song, uh, I'll never forget it. That elephant song, it really got a reaction, you know, like, wow, the kids just, and then I remember going to a few daycares, a friend of mine worked at a daycare and he said, yeah, you can come in and do a show. So I did two or three of those. And every time that elephant song, I would sing that song and kids would go crazy and they start yelling. And I remember one kid starts like grabbing at my shoes and like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and he, he, they were so mad that I would get it wrong, you know, <laughs> and uh, something about it. We realized, wow, there's this something about this has power to it or, you know, it has a value of, of some right. kind. And um, and it really all grew from there. A few years ago, uh, a few years later, we made a very simple video. This was just Roseanne uh, putting something together in the paint program, Microsoft Paint. Right. And uh, it was only meant to be the a demo. I remember she said, I think I have an idea for an elephant song video. Let me throw something together quick. It took her like an hour to do this. And she became embarrassed about it later when it, it became really popular. She's like, I didn't mean for that to like go out there. It was just supposed to be like, here's a demo. Let's hire someone to do it better or right. like to animate it more. Um, if you, if you see the video, it's, it's this very simple thing where you see a picture forming of an elephant and then you see, Oh, it's swinging through a tree and then it backs up. And then there's a monkey that comes out. And again, we just didn't realize we didn't, we didn't know what we had in a sense, you know? And I think what, what made that special was that the simplistic way it was drawn appealed to kids. Like it was, it was almost like a kid drew it. Like, you know, uh, you know, I'm not, not to, uh, uh, <laughs> not to diss her sure. ability to draw but it was right. meant she did not mean that to be anything special right so right. 
And, and I think that that's what we realized that it just had this connection. The song was simple. We had this little girl that we knew recorded. Um, oh, this, this was an important decision too, I think, uh, because when it came time to record that song, the elephant song, by this time I had other songs, we'd written other songs. Uh, I worked with Ken Nesbitt. Do you know who Ken Nesbitt is? I do not. Yeah, he's a pretty well-known uh, poetry, funny poetry author for kids. That Shel Silverstein. Yes. Of more recent times, I would say. Uh, and I connected with him. Uh, he had several funny poems that I thought could be songs. So that was a few of the songs were those. But um, now we had enough for an album. Okay, let's record the elephant song. My thought was to go to do a show somewhere and record it live with all the kids yelling and going crazy, you know, uh, um, and Roseanne, uh, to her credit, she said, parents are going to hate that <laughs> you know, because it's really at times could be, uh, I've actually shortened the song when I perform because it's a bit much sometimes they're just yelling. Ah, it gets, uh, and she said, have one cute little kid that responds to you. And we found this girl we knew, daughter of friends of ours. We, I think we tested a few different kids. or uh, and, and she just, if you listen to the recording, she's just adorable and has this, excuse me, she has this way of responding that it's just endearing, you know, and, and parents and kids just find it super cute, you know, and, and she steals the show from me, absolutely, right? <laughs> But, uh, you know, I like how they swing through trees. No, 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 no. You know, just one little kid. And I think that was the brilliant choice that Roseanne made to help that become what it, what it became. Because it, you put that, that video, what is it, over a million views? Uh, 40 million or something, something like oh, that. Is I don't it? Know. Oh, my something, God. Yeah, yeah. Is it, it, it's it that? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, YouTube YouTube featured it. And that was the other thing in wow. 2007. They had never like featured kids music or any anything like that. Um, I mean, it's nothing. It's a it's a, a thousandth of baby shark. Right, <laughs> you know, right. So these days, it doesn't you know, whatever it is, isn't that much. But at the time, it was it was, you know, a wonderful break for us, really. Uh, we were doing OK, but that really just kind of set wheels in motion for the next several years and, and uh, a lot of performing and music and a lot of fun, a lot of good times. So when you're doing all that, do you find that it's, it's a little, is it easier writing for kids or is it more difficult? Because, you know, I think kids' imaginations, they can go with all of that, right? You know, I mean, obviously- I think it, that, yeah. A lot of those, those, you know, raindrops and all mm -hmm. the things that we did, so- did you it really it depends on the it really depends on the song and the idea um i i at this point uh magic beans will be the ninth album i've put out and i i think it becomes harder to to not i don't like to repeat myself i try to you know if i i have but that becomes hard at some point how about and now i did that before how about no or you know trying to find new ways and new approaches and then for me, the hard thing is always, whether it's a kid song or, or other songs I've written, I, uh, the idea comes maybe quickly and powerfully, and I can get the first verse and the chorus and a second verse and a chorus, and then where do I go from there? <laughs> there, there are probably five or six of the 12 songs on Magic Beans where they sat for two or three years in a point of partially finished so to me that's always the the hard part is um is ha having an idea and then figuring out a way to for one thing what what is what's the best way to to um uh frame the idea or, or arrange it musically how to conclude the idea in a song you know mm -hmm. Uh, not all songs need to be have conclusions. They can just be here. Here's a simple idea, and here's a verse and a chorus and a verse and a chorus. Okay, yeah, that's all you need. But some of the ones uh, that I write, 
seem to suggest, okay, here's an idea. And then, well, where is it leading to? And how, how are we going to get to that point? And uh, I like, I like to be surprised myself. Like I, I don't want it to be that obvious. So a lot of times it just takes a different perspective a year later or something like, oh, oh, how about this? And now I can finish that song that I was super excited about a year ago and, you know, really into it. And then it, I just had to let it go for a while. And is that a lot of, because this, this has been five years, right? In between your last album and, and Magic Beans. Yeah, it'll, I think it'll be, the, the, I think it'll be even more six by okay. the time it's actually out, you know, maybe six years or so, but okay. yeah. And part of that too is, um, I guess the luxury of not feeling like I needed to, to, you know, there was a point back in the day when, yeah, it was a, I, I want to have a new album out every summer because I'm going out and doing a bunch of shows and, and we're scraping to get by. And, you know, it's, it was kind of part of the machine of that, I guess, so to speak. And, um, you know, I, and I had, I was younger and I had more energy and, <laughs> you know to yeah. do to do that i i look at my the third album i put out was called snow day it's still a favorite of mine i every couple of years i'll throw it on and i'll be like oh my my gosh that's still holds up for me mostly and i think it, we wrote all the songs recorded them all produced it all in a matter of two or three months or something like that and you know magic beans six years <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but again, it was, it was partially just, we had to, we felt like we had to get this going and get it done and get it out. And, you know, and sometimes that can be great, you know, great, uh, um, means of, of getting things done. Deadlines are good, you know, for artists. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and, and one of the things about this album and the pandemic and everything, it kept getting pushed back. Well, how about another year? <laughs> You know, right. and I, in, in one sense, I love that because I really, I love diving into the arrangements and the mixing on this, this new album. There's a lot of stuff in there that would not have happened if I put it out in 2020, spring of 2020 was the original plan. You know, most of the songs were done, uh, writing at least and partially recorded. It could have been released then, but I do think it's a lot better for the time spent since then. Did you go go back during the pandemic and just listen to it again and make those changes based on that? Yeah, I, and again, it was some of the luxury of just having that time where I I could put it away for a month, you know. Um, and I, I realized, uh, I, oh, I'm getting obsessive about this one song. I've I've now <laughs> I've now tried 63 vocal tracks on it or something. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, but not not too much. But, and then, you know, we'd get to this point where, and I worked closely with uh, Dave Petty for my band, Puppy Dog Dave, uh, who has a nice studio and everything. And, and, but, you know, we worked together apart somewhat, you know, I'd record stuff, he'd record stuff, we'd get together. And then we'd get to a point where we'd mix something, we'd, or, or the whole album maybe. And then, oh yeah, okay. Now nah, let's let it sit for a month and then we'll come then a month later we listen back and and discover not just things that didn't sound good like we thought they did they we thought they sounded good and a month later it was like eh. but also just discovering new things oh oh how about if we cut this little section here and just it jumps right oh my gosh the song merry go round uh one of the videos that's out was very much uh in a lot of ways, the arrangement, the the pieces of the song uh, were a, a bit like putting a puzzle together or something. You know, it it ended up very different than it started in in some significant ways at, that I think are better because they weren't as calculated. You know, it wasn't here. He, a lot of times, I write a song and here's what it is. It's going to be this and this and you know. But sometimes, uh, if you just let go of what you think it has to be, you hear things that take it in ways that are unexpected and, and, uh, and better for it. I, I, I wanted to ask this earlier, so I'm going to ask this now, but I also, I'm going to take this question and go, go forward, which is 
when you first put Elephant Song out, mm -hmm. I've, I've got to imagine you're thinking, what's the reaction going to be to this? So when you put it mm -hmm. out in, in YouTube, mm -hmm. and and then and then leading to now, you know, are you excited for your fans to get to hear this new album with Magic Beans? What's it like putting an album out and kind of waiting to hear the reaction from your audience? Well, yeah, it's and it's very different. Like my audience is different you know it, it grows up every several years although right. i still have people that still still want to hear every you know or their kids grow up but they still right. want to hear what i'm doing uh, and i really appreciate that but um it's hard to connect the two things uh it's maybe a struggle at this point somewhat in that you know i had this huge huge audience uh at one point and then i to for various reasons didn't feed that mm -hmm. you know we we had new videos coming out every couple of months and then uh through both uh circumstances beyond my control uh roseanne got very ill uh she passed away in 2013 I'm so sorry and um yeah thank you and um and then circumstances in our control that you know we were just a little burned out a little bit um you know i don't know just just couldn't feed that you know and uh but but the amazing thing too is that uh, i <laughs> this surprised me greatly to find out last year there were something like nine million views on on my youtube channel and i hadn't put out a new video in four or five years or something and i'm just like i don't know i i just haven't followed it like i used to you know at the time so there's still this this audience there, right? And uh, but it's also harder. You know, I don't want to bash YouTube. I understand sure. why they do some of this, but they've had they made changes uh, to the children's channels. Like you can't have comments, you can't link to other videos, uh, which you used to. You know, I could I used to have on the at the end of the elephant song, I could have a little thing that popped up. Oh, check out the new video, right. you know, something. And now, and it was a huge uh, way to connect with your audience to, to, to do other things. And so that's not there anymore. So it's, it is a little more challenging, but I am finding, you know, the stuff is getting out there, you know, and, and the algorithms pick it up, you know, and beyond that, more so with this album than the one five or six years ago, I, I, I just, I really recorded, wrote and recorded and releasing everything in, in just a more state of because I want to, because it's there and, uh, and I just, you know, have joy in doing it and creating videos. And uh, it's, it has been gratifying that people are connecting to write and say how much they like certain things or whatever, but it's, I, I don't have as much of that connection because there's no comments on the videos. So it's different than it was, but so are my motivations. So it, it kind of matches where I, I, there's a part of me that doesn't care as much, <laughs> you know, and well, I don't mean that dismissively. Sure. Like I care a lot about what I do and what I put out there, but you know, is it going to connect with a hundred million people? It may not. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm also uh, okay if it does. I'm right, also sure. okay if it does, but you know. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, that's got to be your comments and everything is really going to come out when you, you go live, right? When you're back out there. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. It's got to be exciting to finally get back, you know, get back out there with a the new album and. Mm -hmm. and see we have been going. playing some, a few of the new songs over the past couple of years. And that's been really fun too. And, and uh, great reactions that people have had to, to, you know, some of them and in different ways uh we're also doing a new type of show debuting in march uh, march 18th when the when the album comes out uh, magic beans a stage show and uh this is a show that i've it's something that roseanne and i talked about years and years and years ago that we want to do something more theatrical involving uh video screens and different kind of things happening and uh, using it for comedy and for effect and for, uh, you know, to tell sort of uh, subtextual stories about some of the songs and things like that. Uh, I've had a huge influence uh, 
at a certain point uh, going to Las Vegas and seeing like the Cirque du Soleil shows, the Beatles show there is, have you, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, it's phenomenal. And, yeah. and I, I can't do that. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I, I can't, I'm not a trapeze artist, but the thing about that show that impresses me so much, I've seen it five times now is uh, it's not just the Cirque du Soleil trapeze and all that. There's incredible lighting and video and uh, uh, props and costumes and uh, you know the, the way they remix the music on, on every possible level. It's just a phenomenal experience. So I, we are taking some of that and putting it into the show that we're doing coming up. And um, also the, on, on the other side of the coin, uh, I saw American Utopia, uh, David Burns yep. Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was phenomenal and, and very different because it's, it's more minimalist. You know, there's not really that much on stage, but they do some really creative things with lighting and the, the staging and the way the, the musicians move around and everything. So somewhere between those two things is the show that I'm trying to do. And uh, the last time I was in Vegas, um, it, I saw Blue Man Group. I saw the Beatles show again. I saw um, Meow Wolf, the Omega Mark thing that they're doing. And I realized this is what I'm trying to do. So that is the ultimate goal of this show is to, to bring it to Vegas. I have done several shows there over the year, over the years. Um, but I, I'm trying to, you know, the show we're doing in March is in my hometown here at a theater. It's kind of the demo, like the, yeah. the proof of concept and we're getting footage and I'm going to try to, you know, try to get that around the world and elsewhere. Appearing I love, on, on I Venus. Because <laughs> I, I love all those shows you're talking about. And I, I, I think it's, it's fabulous. What do you do to, to, change it a little bit for a kid's audience. Well, yeah. And uh, or thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I, I meant to, to say that what I realized uh, when I was there in October is that kids were at these shows. And I remember the Beatles show, a little girl was on, on the aisle next to us and just laughing and, and just, you know, amazed. And I realized that there, there isn't that kind of audience being served in a sense. Um, I, I looked up an article one day, I was looking for something to do. I had a Saturday afternoon free or Friday afternoon or something. What do you do in Vegas during the afternoon? And the article pointed out a couple of things, but it also said something like, oh, it's kind of an underserved market, you know? So, um, I, you know, as I envision it, I, I, my, my best case scenario is Magic Beans, uh, a family, interactive family extravaganza uh, or actually we call it um, musical, a musical, a musical, theatrical, magical, and beanical family experience. <laughs> and I can picture that at a, you know, in a theater in Vegas someday, you know, or, or one of the casinos that's, uh, you, you pass through the, the shops and all that. Oh, here's the magic beans theater. You know, I, I have this vision of that and I, I hope to see it come true someday, but but I think, yeah, it, for one thing, it's my songs, you know, it's our songs. Sure. So that it's already speaking on that level. Sure. But, uh, and, and the way that some of the comedy is, uh, I mean, Blue, Blue Man Group is very family friendly. I don't think there's anything, you know, yeah. as I recall, uh, adult about it per se, but, um, but the kind of jokes again, and, and, but also again, the, the way we've written the show, is it works it's written mm, probably towards upper nine ten year olds and grown-ups are going to get some jokes that the four-year-olds aren't going to get and that's okay right or they explain explain it to them later you know what that why everybody laughed at that one point you know but um well so and there's a re the recurring theme of magic beans uh which i love the idea of uh just something that seems small and insignificant, these little beans that grows into something incredible, you know, which you, it can be a person, you know, it could be a universe. It can be all, a, a song, you know, all kinds of things. I, I love the, the, uh, the connection of that thematically. And, you know, there's just one joke, a character walks out on stage 
and, and these are in between songs that we do. We have different interludes that build on this idea of magic means. He walks out with a big uh, Starbucks coffee cup. Ah, magic beans. You know, grown-ups are going to get that. Right. Kids aren't going to get it. Right. But um, so it's so that kind of thing. But I I, I do think the whole show. Um, always still works for you know five to ten year olds you know and how do you i'm guessing this show that you're going to do the demo you're testing that out as well how the audience yeah. reacts and make adjustments and things from sure there. this uh you know this show we're doing we're doing six performances two for schools and then four public ones over a five-day period in march and uh it's kind of like when you know a broadway show opens well you didn't it wasn't on broadway first it was in boston or chicago right. first and they kind of tweaked it a little bit and right. you know worked out some kinks so that's kind of what we're we're viewing this as a premiere it's like we're doing it's we're going to make this as as good as we can but yeah i imagine you know it, next time we go to Seattle is is kind of the next uh, point because it's close and it's big and I've played there a lot and uh, and then hopefully Vegas or you know LA or somewhere else by the time it hits those different things yeah we'll have changed a few things or re rewritten a few things I actually I actually want the show to be a little different each place too it's kind of the way some of the nature of it works uh, for example there's like I said there's these interludes. And I think the opening one is locked in. I love that we have this opening sequence that I think gets you into the, the idea of it really well. But some of the interludes, maybe at some point we're like, oh, well, let's write a different one because we're here or, or just because we want to do something different, you know? Right. I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about Magic Beans, about the new, mm -hmm. new music. And you had mentioned this to me right before we started this. So I think we got to start there with, okay. with your song Stinker <laughs> as oh. a reference to, uh, to my favorite purple dinosaur. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I hate to spoil it. You know, I'll just give it, there is, um, when I, it's just a teaser. We're not going to spoil it. It's just a little teaser. Coming up on uh, February 18th is the next new video from Magic Beans. Currently, there's three ones already out there. Googly Eyes, Merry Go Round, and Side Scroller. Go watch them uh, four million times, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've added to that. Or not. I as I said before, whatever. It's fine. I, but I, I have added to that count because I have watched them. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one is uh, February 18th, and it's called Stinker. And it's kind of a simpler one than the first three. Uh, those were pretty, I think, pretty epic things, each of them in their way. This is just a simple song about um, uh, a kid. It's kind of um, his faults and his shortcomings. Um, I, I'll, I'll just spoil a little bit of it. The, the first verse is, um, I will never be afraid of the dark as long as you keep on the light. I will never be someone who complains as long as everything's just right. I will be so patient as long as I don't have to wait. And I am always humble. I think that's what really makes me great. You know, so it's these, and, and he's singing this, and I don't know, I, I envision it as, uh, you know, kind of a self self-reflective thing of, when I was a kid, yeah, I had those qualities. I still do, maybe in different ways. But uh, and and it's and it's done as a ballad. This was another thing, I guess, kind of like the elephant song, where I I thought I was writing something a lot more serious uh, because the music. I, I had this little. You know, a very kind of a pretty, almost a lullaby. You know, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a, a sweet, you know, maybe spiritual kind of song or something. And then I, for, for whatever reason, that first line came out. I will never be afraid of the dark as long as you keep on the light. You know, and even then that first line, you're maybe you're like, 
because it's not overtly like some of the later ones like I'll, I'll I'm always humble that's what makes me great that's more obviously you know uh stinkery I guess the word right. is but um I I so but I like how that I meant to do one thing again and it turned into a completely different thing and there's a part in the bridge of the song and I don't want to spoil it because it is I, I think it's one of the funniest parts when you as you lead into it and you see where it goes but there is a definite reference to your former character <laughs> mr so barney check that out <laughs> and I, I i believe i've careful we've carefully uh avoided direct copyright infringement it's it's barney ish the p depiction that you see I showed you, I, you, Carrie said, Carrie said I should be okay, but. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to be good. I think you're going to be good. Right. Well, I'm thinking about all this as we're talking about this album. And I'm curious when you're, when you're writing these songs and you're putting a message out there for now we're talking about, right, right six to 10, eight to 10. Do you mm -hmm. go, maybe that one's going to be over their head or maybe that one's too simple. You know, we were doing songs for two-year-olds, so we knew to go really simple. Yeah, you, and, and I guess- really think about that when you're putting this well, in song? It, it's something that we, Roseanne and I talked a lot about. For one thing, primarily I try not to be messagey. I try to be more entertainment, you know, and again, not to um, at all to criticize people who are, you know, there is a, a wonderful segment of people who do music for kids that, have great messages and they portray them in great ways more more of the time that's not what i'm trying to do it's just trying to kind of eh, a little skewed look at things uh different lens on on how you look at life maybe you know uh there is one song uh well there's 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 definitely songs with messages on all on all my albums and in a lot of what i do but i think i feel like they're more subtextual they're kind of um, um, googly eyes, you know, you could say it's a pretty simple song about this kid who puts googly eyes on everything. And it, it becomes increasingly, he puts them on the Statue of Liberty and then the pyramids and all these things. And, you know, I, I, I imagine this is a case where maybe it's good that there aren't YouTube comments, because I would probably get some from parents like you're encouraging kids to put googly eyes on whenever it's graffiti or something you know right right and the the i guess my subtextual message there is just the freedom of artistry you know it's and it's something i you know i feel like this kid has this that this is his art form and you get to this point where he fantasizes later about someday i can work for nasa and i'll put giant googly eyes on the moon and then everyone will look up and see and they'll be like oh this is beautiful now i get it you know and it's really just in his mind. Um, but, you know, to me, there is still this, this underlying message of, you know, your art is worth pursuing and, you know, you, and yet you're going to fa face challenges for it. And in the whole video and the song, he gets in trouble every time. <laughs> so there is that, right? There is one song uh, called Mushroom Pizza okay. on Magic Beans. And uh, it's uh, so far, I would say a lot of people's favorites that they've heard. We've played it live. Um, it's not out there yet. It'll be out when the album's released. Uh, you can hear it, but um, and it's a, a song really about tolerance. And uh, you know, there, there's you couldn't you could attach it to a lot of things, but on the simplest level, it's just me not liking mushroom pizza, which I don't. <laughs> this is true, <laughs> and uh, and like taking that to an extreme where I want to banish all mushroom pizza from the world. Like, you know, and then the two guys in the band, Ben and Dave, kind of school me on that. A little bit like the elephant song in that sense, where it's like, wait a minute, Eric, you know, and there's, and I think the way that uh, I, I was a little hesitant about, about that too, about how to, because yeah, this is, you could interpret it as pretty messagey in some senses, but I think here's where the comedy helps it, right? There's this underlying level of absurdity about it, <laughs> but also there's a lot of uh, 
small comedic moments. The guys in the band are funny the way they react to me. And, and, and it goes in, in, in directions you don't expect to. And again, I don't want to spoil it. Sure. <laughs> right. But it builds in a way. And, uh, and, and so I think in as much as I, as there is any message that I'm trying to get through, <clears throat> there are some things about, uh, be, you know, be kind, be creative, be fair, be, um, be yourself, be, be artistic. And, uh, you know, there, there is, there are some underlying themes and messages on this album for sure. Um, but I think for that song and, and in as much as I try to do that, I think it's, it's smoothed over by comedy or by being, something that's um uh maybe vague or or able to be interpreted in different ways and i i don't want to tell parents or anybody specific things but you might take one thing from it another person might take a, a different thing from it that's okay you know does it take a lot longer to put an album together like this because of the, because of it being a kids album where uh, not necessarily, you know, I, I think a lot of the time factor had to do with, um, first of all, like I told you before, is that I tend to write songs and then I stop half halfway through the song. Right. I'm just like, where do I go? All right. I guess I got to just, I'll come back to that next year or something. Right. You know? uh, because literally the first, the, the last album we put out was 2016. I think later in 2016, three or four of the songs started getting written side scroller uh first couple of verses of that uh stinker was about half done at that point and then it got to 2018 oh we got a few more songs oh let's start talking about doing an album here uh, and then but again now we still had these kind of half songs and some of those started to get finished and then 2019 is when we really started recording and arranging uh, remember what I said? Uh, oh, spring of 2020, we'll right. put it out. <laughs> well, and then, I mean, I guess we could have, but the idea still was that, you know, you put something out and now you want to go out and perform it and, and promote it. So that's why we kept, you know, pushing it back. So a, a lot of it just had to do with, um, you know, the time frame of finishing the songs. Uh, again, I'm glad we waited at a certain point because uh, some of the people that performed on the song, on the album, uh, Jeff Walling plays drums, and I knew him from Buffalo many years before, uh, and we only reconnected on Facebook, I think, uh, late 2019. I was like, oh my gosh, Jeff, yeah, I haven't talked to him in 20 years or something. Oh, he was a great drummer. You know what? I was looking for a drummer to play on this album. There it was, you know, so if it had happened sooner, that wouldn't have worked out. Um, so things like that and, and the way some of the, the songs were arranged was I definitely benefited from that extra time. But it, it wasn't necessary. I, like, I, you know, I know people who, uh, you know, well, well, like I said, Snow Day, I did that in two or three months from I, I, we had no songs written, recorded and nothing. And it all all came together very quickly like that. So, well, I was just curious because because of your audience, you know, because of a kid's audience, you have to. Does more have to go into that? Is it you know? Is it is the message there or not there? Is it fun enough? Is it this or that compared to when you're writing for adults? A lot of times you can you're just writing your songs and putting them out there. Not always, you know, are they going to like this or not? Does any of that go into it when you're writing for kids? uh i'm sorry can you repeat that a second yeah no basically i'm just curious when you're writing for kids because it's it's a little bit of a different different ball game right is this song over their head or do i care or is there a message or not a message or will they get the joke or will they where for adults you, you can just kind of write a song and they like yeah. it or don't get it you know what I, right that's what i'm curious on some level uh I'm, I'm always writing stuff for, for myself first and it sounds selfish, but it, you're the person that has to live with it the most. And, you know, 
So, and I'm, I guess I'm channeling that 10 year old in me, which is always there <laughs> still, you know, I'm always still, and, and at some point I think, okay, yeah, I think this could, could resonate with an eight year old or something, maybe not, but, and that, at that point I'm like, okay, yeah, this, I can go forward with, with this. Um, but, and, and yeah, there is some reflection on how well does something work? Is the message clear? Are the lyrics clear? There's, there's a lot of that. Yeah. But I don't know that it necessarily uh, takes more time. It's really uh, because you can compress if, you know, um, bands go into a studio for a week with nothing and come out with a whole album, you know? And, and so, I mean, if, if you have that focus, part of my problem is that, you know, I'm traveling around or I'm doing shows and, and doing other things. Uh, again, I, I, I don't have the same um, uh, necessity that I did the early years when I, my family might not eat tonight if I don't go and get this thing going and all that. Uh, so it's a little, there's the luxury of time in that sense. Um, but and that at that point, it just becomes a, a question of when does it feel finished or where does, and that's really hard too. That's hard to know, but good question. Is the, is the puppy dogs, that's your band. Are they involved in the process? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, several of the songs we either um, came up with some aspect of it together. Like we, a lot of times, especially me and Dave, uh, just sitting around playing music together and then, uh, oh, ooh, ooh, how, how about this chord change or this little sequence side scroller, that little thing, do, 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 that was just me and Dave switching up instruments. You know, my guitar is my main instrument. And a lot of times that can limit you when you're trying to create something because you tend to go to the same places or some of the same chords. While Dave had this cheap old little Casio keyboard or something in his basement, hooked it up, he got on guitar and played some chords and I started just by accident came up with this little thing on keyboard and, and, and again, that's all it was initially, right? And then I, but I had this idea that it sounded like a video game theme or something, right? So we slowly it became uh, what it became. And, and lyrically sometimes too, uh, Dave and I, uh, well, Ben helped with side scroller. He was more the expert on that, on, on those. I've played a lot of video games, but he's played a lot of side scroller specific video games. So he fed me all these things that later I turned into lyrics and, and, uh, Dave and I, at some point months before googly eyes, we talked about what if there's some song or something about some kid who like puts googly eyes on everything. And that's all it was like, Oh, Oh, like the Mona Lisa, you know? And it just, yeah, make it absurd. And I forgot about that for months and months, uh, seven or eight months or something and woke up in the middle of the night one night and suddenly, Oh, and I started writing out all the lyrics of googly eyes. It came out <laughs> strangely, but it, it had to, it had the seed had to be planted in my brain months prior. So yeah, uh, those guys helped a lot with uh, various songs in various ways. And, um, and they're, they're tremendous on the album. I love so much of what they add to it. Uh, ben on accordion and piano and Dave is a, is a monster at about 43 instruments. And uh, he does all these I'll say, Dave, add some vocal harmonies to the end of Side Scroller. And he comes back with like 14 different tracks that are all harmonized. And just, it's, it's almost too much. I'm like, no. But uh, almost all of it was good. And I end up, you know, picking a few things to use from it. And it's a good problem to have when someone gives you, here's five takes and they're all really good. That's a good problem to have, you know. But does it slow down the process a little bit? Because now you're like, okay. it can, yeah, <laughs> it can, yeah. I, I remember there's a song, "Really Asleep." It's on the album, uh, and Ben sent me uh, an organ part for it, and he just sent one track. He, he said, "Here, just, is this like, is this in the ballpark of what you want?" Even, 
And I said, that's exactly what I want. Don't record anything else. <laughs> because because then I would have had the problem where, oh, now I have four different takes. And I got to figure out what pieces to use. No, that was just really awesome as it was. Don't give me any more. But usually I would want a few different takes, you know, and I'll kind of, you know, uh, Mary go round. He sent me a bunch of different stuff. I, I said uh, the first thing he he sent me piano and it was more pastoral, if that makes sense. Like it was beautiful, yeah. wonderful piano, but it was it was kind of not kind of not what I was feeling. And I and I said, how about mystical instead of pastoral? And he's like, OK, <laughs> so then he sent me another four or five takes. And and yeah, oh, my gosh, it was mystical. But, but then again, even from there, like, uh, he, and I mentioned this before with Mary go around the arrangement on that took a lot of different directions. He, he had piano through much of the whole song. And I remember going, it was the challenge for me. And this is like the editor part of a musician, right? Is you go back and you say, oh, it only really needs something here, here, here. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Even though the rest of it is really nice it's it stands out better if it's only in certain places and it helps everything else stand out better and you know what i mean it, it, it yeah anyway no i know I, I absolutely love it this has been such a pleasure talking to you and hearing about yeah that. and i know you you got your guitar there could you play something off the new album and this is a song um i don't know if you've seen the video maybe but <clears throat> where the first thing I, I came up with was just this little guitar part. Merry go round. Merry go round. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I played that over and over for like a half hour, just that little bit. Merry go round. And at first I'm like, hmm, that could be the whole song. Just like three minutes of that over and over. Because really, I was thinking of, you know, the, the earth as a merry-go-round, the galaxy as a merry-go-round, you know, life, it's just, you know, thinking on that scale and, and really the, it almost, it almost hurts the idea to add lyrics to it, right? I think because it's just that drone of it or that the hypnotic nature of it, merry-go-round, now you realize, oh yeah, this Every day is a merry-go-round. Where, but then, as the uh, the day went on later, and the next day, and I'm like, oh no, I think it needs some context, you know. So I ended up writing one verse, and I said, okay, it's just going to be this one verse. Now then, I wrote another one, <laughs> wrote another one. So it ended up being three verses, and and uh, I love it regardless, but. Um, I think it could all, it could just be that one simple idea. Uh, anyway, I'll just play it for you. How about you hear the guitar? Okay. Every day, every night, spinning through dark and light, find your place, hold on tight. Smile and wave, merry go round. Merry go round. Every life, big and small, here on this turning ball, we are part of it all. Smile and wave, merry go round. Merry go round. Merry go round. Merry go round. Every day, you and me, whirling round endlessly, Milky Way, galaxy, smile and wave, merry-go-round, merry 
go round, round and round and round, round and round and round and round, round and round and round and round and round, round and round, round and round and round and round. Round and round and round and round and round. Every day, every night, spinning through dark and light, find your place, hold on tight, smile and wave. Merry go round. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank and I you. love the, the simple of the message. I think that's a great thing that you can do with kids' music, is it, it can be that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Smile and wave. Merry go round. <laughs> this is it. This is it. <laughs> We're, well, this is the ride. And this is the ride. And we are the riders. <laughs> yes. Yes. Enjoy yes. the ride. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. It's, uh, it's fun to meet you, Carrie. I really appreciate it. Where let everyone know, and we'll put it in the notes of this, but where can everyone find the album when it comes out? When does the album come out? March 18th. It should be on all of the things, you know. Uh, you and it's essentially Apple, it's, it's, Apple and Google and all those things. It's essentially free for if you have any of those things, right? Um, we, I am making a limited amount of CDs that will include an extra song that's not on that um and uh eventually vinyl that's all backed up though for a long time but Crazy. uh and then the music videos go to youtube look up eric herman um or for my channel should be there or you know especially the new ones i'd love people to see googly eyes merry-go-round uh side scroller uh coming up february 18th is stinker with a a barney reference and then march 18th the song magic beans the music video for magic beans which is by the way it's a 3d vr music oh, video wow. uh it'll all there will also be a 2d version you know you can still enjoy it i think for what it is but yeah it was it was created to be seen you know with vr goggles and everything it's really really cool the song magic beans the video for that the album magic beans and then the debut of the stage show that uh for the public that day march 18th also and then any upcoming tour dates and all that will be on your website. Yeah. Yeah. Eric Herman music.com or just look up Eric Herman on Google. I think I'll come up first. There was a, a football player named Eric Herman who stole some of my Google <laughs> things for a little while, but I think he, I don't know if he's playing anymore, but. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Good luck with the new album. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Carrie. Really great to meet you. Take nice care. Nice meeting you. And thank you for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week.